Hello everyone and welcome to Real Business's first webinar 2018. My name's Freddie Heritage and I'm the Deputy Editor of Real Business. Over the next hour we'll be taking an in-depth look at one of the most important legislative changes taking place for British SMEs, SMEs this year. It's the General Data Protection Regulations, also known as GDPR. Coming into force on the 25th of May, GDPR introduces a single set of rules across the EU relating to how businesses are able to use people's personal information. Devised to safeguard the data protection rights of individuals, the new rules have far-reaching implications for SME owners, with the possibility of significant fines being doled out for non-compliance. With less than three months to go before GDPR becomes a reality, an astonishing number of companies are still not ready for the changes. According to a recent poll from the Federation of Small Businesses, Fewer than one in 10 of Britain's SMEs are fully prepared for the new GDPR rules. And even though the GDPR clock is ticking loudly, time has not yet run out for firms to become compliant. With some organisations, with some organisation and a clearly thought out process in place, company owners can still take their first steps towards GDPR compliance and be ready by the 25th of May. To help guide you through the last few months before the rules come into effect, I'm joined today by James Castro Edwards, a data protection expert and a partner on the data protection team at law firm Wedlet Blake. James will kick off today's webinar with a 20 minute presentation on the latest developments in GDPR and what they mean for your business. We'll then follow that with a brief Q&A session between James and myself before we round things up by giving you the chance to submit your GDPR questions to James in an interactive session. If you have a question about GDPR you'd like, to you'd like to ask James at the end of today's webinar, then please remember to submit it through the GoToWebinar control panel. To gauge your views on GDPR and the stage your firm is at at the compliance journey, Real Business will also be running a poll throughout the webinar and will reveal the results at the end, so please submit your answers at any stage. I'll launch the poll questions during the Q&A session uh, and revealing your answers as we go along. So, so please make sure to listen in closely and submit your answers to make your views known. Without further ado then, I'll pass over to James who will kick off today's webinar with his presentation. Thanks very much, Freddie. Uh, my name is James Castro Edwards and I'm a partner and head of data protection at Wedlake Bell. And what I'm gonna cover today is first of all, the background to the law. Um, so what I'd like to explain is to the way the uh, GDPR is in fact uh, more of an evolution than a revolution and perhaps allay some fears around the GDPR. I'm going to talk about the key concepts and the principles and the changes that the GDPR will introduce. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk about practical compliance. So in other words, what do you need to do to stay on the right side of the law? Now, I'm conscious of the fact that we've only got 20 odd minutes to talk about this, uh, quite a lot to uh, cover. So so let's dive in at the deep end. Um, so first of all, uh, it's important to remember that the GDPR, yes, it's new, um, but it's uh, an evolution of the existing law rather than a revolution. The current law is contained in the Data Protection Directive 9546 EC, which applies across Europe in all of the European member states. So we see from the 95, that says that that's when the directive became law. In fact, the drafting started in the late 1980s. So as you can imagine, um, 30 years later, it's a little long in the tooth. Now, the directive doesn't operate directly in all the member states, but it requires implementing legislation. So in the UK, we have the Data Protection Act 1998, but in each of the European member states, they will have an equivalent piece of law, um, which contains the provisions of the directive. And it applies to data controllers that have established or use equipment in a particular EU member state. So I'll explain what that means in a minute. Now, again, I must stress the fact this is pan-European legislation. So in Europe, each member state has a piece of law like the Data Protection Act 1998. Now, you may well ask, why am I talking about the Data, Data Protection Act when it's going to be repealed? Well, as you'll see shortly, the law um, is very similar. There are a lot of similarities that carry over the key concepts uh, from the Data Protection Act and the directive to the GDPR. So if you're compliant with the current law, you're going to be in good shape for the new one. In the UK, the Data Protection Act is enforced by the Information Commissioner's Office, or the ICO, uh, who can issue fines of up to £500,000 for breaches, potentially higher for certain financial services companies. And there are also criminal offences under Section 55 
of the Data Protection Act. Now again, each European member state will have an equivalent data protection authority to the ICO. So in France they have the CNIL, in Poland they have the GEODO, uh, and so on. So each uh, member state has a piece of data protection law and it has a data protection authority to enforce it. Now again, uh, I mentioned before the, um, the, both the directive and the regulation rely on a number of key concepts. So, and these are the fundamental building blocks, if you like. And if you understand these and how they work, this is going to set you on your way for being compliant with the GDPR. So, these are the concepts taken from uh, the Data Protection Directive, but again, they carry forward largely the same to the GDPR. The first and foremost of these is personal data. So, this is data by which a living individual may be identified. So, that could be things like an email address, a uh, name, a telephone number. It could be things like social media, um, profiles, uh, browser history, CCTV footage of you entering or leaving the building, your car registration plate and the details that the DVLA holds about you. Uh, any individual, uh, any information by which a living individual may be identified. But it can also include statements of opinion about that individual. Uh, processing is what's regulated by the GDPR and it's defined very broadly. And that includes the obtaining, recording, holding, or carrying out any set of operations or an operation on personal data. In other words, pretty much anything you can do with personal data other than thinking about it or dreaming about it. And that's deliberate, so it's divide, uh, defined broadly so that all the things that you would do with personal data are regulated. The important part I mentioned earlier was um, the, the Data Protection Act and the Data Protection Regulation apply to data controllers, or just controllers as they're referred to under the GDPR. And this is the legal person, so when we say legal person, that can mean an individual, but also a business, whether it's a company or a partnership, um, or the, the organisation that decides the purposes for which and the manner in which data are processed. So for example, if you have a small business that processes information about its employees in order to pay them, and information about its customers in order to sell them goods or services, that business will be a data controller in relation to its employees and a data controller or controller in relation to its customers. And that means that it's responsible for complying with the law. In contrast with the controller is a processor. A processor does things with personal data, but not um, autonomously. It does those in accordance with the instructions of the controller. So what the controller would say to the processor is, for example, can you calculate the payroll for my employees? Or can you send this email marketing shot to our prospects and our customers? And the processor takes the personal data from the controller and does those uh, things as requested by the controller. Um, and so it doesn't make decisions and it doesn't have a free hand. And the significance of the distinction is that under the current law, controllers are responsible for compliance with the law and processes are not. Under the GDPR, both controllers and processors must comply uh, with the GDPR and risk sanctions if they fail to do so. The next concept to be aware of is data subjects. And so these are the individuals to whom personal data relate. And that could be your employees, it could be your customers and your suppliers. Uh, so one of the crucial exercises that I'll explain later is understand what personal data you hold. And to do that, you need to see who do you hold personal data about. So that will always be your employees, your ex-employees, pension scheme members, job applicants, inquirers, and so on, as well as your customers, people inquiring about your products and services, people you've done business with, um, and people who uh, may supply you with products as well. And that can be both whether these are individuals, or it could be a contact point at a, at a customer or a supplier. So if you sell on a business-to-business -business basis, or you buy from a business-to-business -business supplier, you may have the name and the contact details of the procurement person, um, and that will be personal data, even though it's in their work capacity. Lastly, um, there's a concept called notification. Now, notification requires an annual filing with the Information Commissioner's Office to say what you do with personal data. And that's a transparency um, measure. And you have to pay a small fee, £35 for small businesses, uh, 500 for larger businesses. And that's the way that the ICO is funded. Now, the good news is under the GDPR, notification is abolished. But there are other things that you need to do to make sure that you remain compliant. So those are the main key concepts. There's one more very important one, what we call sensitive personal data under the Data Protection Act, 
and special categories of personal data under the GDPR. And this is a subset of personal data that requires a higher standard of care. So if you find yourself processing personal data about people's race, their ethnic origin, their physical or mental health, whether or not they're a member of a trade union, their religious beliefs, their sexual preferences, um, or whether or not they've committed a criminal offence and details of their criminal prosecutions, that's sensitive personal data or special categories of personal data, and that requires a higher standard of care. Now, if you lose sensitive personal data or you don't take care of it and somebody is able to access it without authorization, it's likely to cause the individual distress because it's the sort of information that they won't want the public at large to know about. And as a result, if the information commissioner becomes aware that you've lost sensitive personal data, the sanctions are likely to be stricter. And that's the both, both the case under the existing law and the GDPR. So if you do something that involves sensitive personal data or the special categories of personal data, you must make sure that you take appropriate care of that personal data. But the key part of the GDPR and the Data Protection Act is the principles. And on the left, on this next slide, you can see are the principles under the Data Protection Act, and on the right, they are what they're described as under the GDPR. And the first of these is fair and lawful processing. And what this means is that if you're using people with personal data, you need to tell them who you are and what you're doing with their personal data. And that can be by way of a website privacy notice, um, it's generally the best way, or it might be a pre recorded message. You also need to establish a lawful ground for processing. Now, the best known of these is consent, but there are other grounds. So, for example, if you're taking somebody's name and address and payment details in order to sell them a product or a service online, um, you don't need their consent to do that. You, what you need, uh, you can, your use of that personal information is justified because it's for the performance of a contract. Now, it's slightly complex of the legal grounds, but bear in mind, Whatever you do with personal data, you need to tell people, and you also need to establish a legal ground. So that's the first and foremost principle. Where you tell people what you're doing, um, it's a specified purpose in your privacy notice, for example, um, and you need to make sure that you only use it for that purpose and not for other incompatible purposes. Now in the GDPR, that's called purpose limitation, but it amounts to the same thing. The third principle is that uh, personal data needs to be adequate, relevant, or not excessive. So you only need to collect the personal data for the purpose in hand. Much as it might be nice to have or just in case you need further information, you only collect the, collect the minimum data for the purpose that you need. So for example, if you're selling products and services online, you need the payment details, identifiers of who you're dealing with, and your address to send an invoice. And if you don't need the personal data, you shouldn't collect it. Personal data needs to be accurate and up to, up to date. Under the GDPR, we call that accuracy. But well, what this means is that if you hold information about people, it needs to be exactly suggested, accurate, and up to date. Now, the risks around here vary from it could be a minor inconvenience if you're misspelling a customer's name, uh, but if it's medical records and these are out of date, that's potentially life or death. So you can see the accuracy principle is crucial. You shouldn't hold personal data for longer than is necessary. Now, there'll be a variety of reasons for holding personal data whether that's business reasons, legal reasons, or other um, regulatory obligations upon you, you need to have a, a valid reason for holding personal data, uh, after which that personal data should be deleted. So it's highly unlikely you would ever be able to hold personal data indefinitely. And the information commissioner would expect to see some sort of record retention schedule. Um, so that's the storage limitation period, and that's very important. Personal data needs to be processed in accordance with the data subject's rights. So as you know, we all have a right to see the personal data that's held about us by organisations, whether that's our bank or our employer. Um, under the GDPR, these rights are broadened. And it's very important to make sure that as an organisation, you understand what people's rights are and you uphold them. So if they ask to see a copy of their personal data or they ask to see that deleted, you make sure you have the processes and procedures in place to manage those requests. Personal data needs to be held securely. Now, um, in the GDPR, there's a whole chapter divided to, uh, devoted to it, um, but it's essential that you hold personal data securely, both in your systems and in the way that your staff handle personal data. And most of the data breaches you see uh, in the press are where people or organisations have failed to process personal data adequately, and they get themselves into trouble for where they've lost that personal data. 
Lastly, personal data should not be transferred outside the European Economic Area, or the EEA. So if personal data is in Europe, is protected. If you transfer it out of Europe, even if it's to a parent company in the US, you still have to have measures in place to protect that personal data. So as you see, so far the principles under the GDPR and the DPA are pretty much similar. The only new principle that the GDPR introduces is the accountability principle. And that means uh, that it's not enough to just comply with the rules, but you've got to be able to demonstrate compliance. So the ICA would expect to see policies and procedures and processes uh, to, to make sure that you comply with the GDPR, to make sure you comply with these obligations. So what are the changes that the, that the GDPR introduces? I've already explained the, the similarities. Um, under the GDPR, there are some differences as well. So first and foremost is the GDPR applies to organisations established uh, in the EU, uh, whether they are um, controllers or processes, and also those established outside the EU whose, direct, whose goods and services are direct to the European citizens. The accountability principle I've explained, so um, rather than just complying with the rules, you need to make sure you can demonstrate compliance. The third change, or the very significant, that has been widely discussed is the idea around consent. So consent um, is much more difficult to establish under the GDPR. It needs to be freely given and capable of withdrawal at any time. And essentially, um, the, the data subject uh, has the element of choice. So you need to give people a genuine choice. You need to explain to them what you're going to do with their personal data. And if they say they don't want you to do that, you generally uh, have to agree with that. You have to uphold their wishes. But you can't process personal data about people unless you have another legal reason for doing so. Some types of organisation will need to appoint a data protection officer, which is a data protection specialist uh, who will help the company understand its obligations and will oversee its obligations under the GDPR. That's a very important role. Uh, it doesn't need to be a full-time role, but the DPO needs to really understand what they're doing with personal data. A new measure is uh, privacy impact assessments, or PIAs. So if you process personal data about individuals, you need to be able to um, identify what the risks are with that personal data. So for example, if you're going to implement a new system, you need to understand what the risks are, and you need to put in place measures to mitigate any risks. So for example, if you're thinking about implementing a CCTV system, you conduct a privacy impact assessment, and you do things like position the cameras so that they don't um, record images of people in uh, places where they wouldn't expect that to be the case and have an expectation of privacy. Another change is that the GDPR requires that data breaches are notified to the Data Protection Authority. So if you lose personal data, you need to inform the Data Protection Authority within 72 hours. And where it's a serious breach, you need to inform the data subject as well. If you fail to, if you fail to do so, that's a, a breach of the GDPR, for which you could be in big trouble. Many of you may have heard of the enhanced data subject rights, such as the right to be forgotten, and the right to data portability. But the GDPR is all about giving individuals control and choice around the use of their personal data. The right to be forgotten is that in certain circumstances, not all, you can request that the Data Protection Authority deletes your personal data, um, uh, sorry, the data, data controller rather. And if you also want your personal data transferred to a new service provider, like uh, another bank or an insurer, you can exercise your um, right to data portability and the, and the organization that you've provided your data to needs to transfer that to a third party at your request. So from a company's point of view, if you're doing things with personal data, you need to understand what their new rights are. And the penalties you've all heard of, up to 4% of worldwide annual turnover. I'll explain that more in the next slides. Um, there's also some minor changes around definitions and fair processing notice, notices. So, Generally, the definitions under the GDPR are largely the same, uh, but under the uh, yeah, but there are some subtle changes. Um, but really, this is going to be relevant when you're very, very much on top of your compliance measures. So, so I don't propose to spend much time on that. But the most important thing around fair processing notices, and this is what we call the website privacy notice. Uh, so when you look online, and there'll be a privacy notice which will explain what the organisation does with your personal data and how you, how you complain. But the GDPR is uh, very specific on what those privacy notices need to incorporate. It's important that you include that information that you can find yourself in trouble. So 
I'm conscious of the fact that pretty much every um, GDPR expert and so-called expert focuses on the penalties, which are indeed up to 4% of worldwide annual turnover, or um, 20 million euros, which is around 17, 17 million sterling, or whichever is the greater. A lot of, um, there's a lot of scaremongering in, in, in the press and so on, saying that um, the risks we face if you don't comply with the GDPR, and so much so that the Information Commissioner has issued a blog saying that they are not going to be running around issuing enormous fines for minor transgressions of the GDPR. Nonetheless, it's true that the GDPR includes these sanctions, and these are included by the um, European Commission as, a, as an attempt to escalate data protection compliance to a corporate board level topic, and it's worked. So the, uh, we're seeing a lot of requests for organisations who want to make sure that they're compliant with the new law. Now it would have to be a pretty serious breach, and it would have to cause uh, a lot of risk or harm to individuals to be hit with a, a fine of that enormity. And the Data Protection Authority in the UK said that, expressly said that they do not intend to be issuing severe fines um, for minor transgressions. However, you need to be aware that you must comply with the GDPR and its requirements because in the worst case scenario, uh, the, these fines do exist. It's also to be important to be aware that there's a, a right by which uh, individuals can claim compensation, which is aside from the GDPR and from the data protection laws, and this is a private right of action. So if you lose people's personal data and it causes them distress, they can potentially claim for compensation under a piece of case law uh, called by Del and Google. Now, I won't go into detail on that, uh, but just be aware that it's not just the regulator you need to be aware of is that the risk from ambulance chasing lawyers like PPI claims that there's a similar possibility here. So that's a whistle-stop tour through what the GDPR is, uh, the, the similarities between the current law and the differences and what happens if you get it wrong. Um, so how can you keep yourself out of trouble? Well first of all um, as an organisation you need to understand exactly what personal data you hold so as I mentioned before about your employees, your customers, uh, your suppliers, um, why you hold that and the legal reason for doing so and who you share it with. Now, for any of these activities that you carry out with personal data, you must have a legal basis. So if you remember uh, on the principal slides, you need to tell people what you're doing with their personal data and you need to have a legal basis for doing so, whether that's their consent or for the performance of a contract so that you can comply with a legal obligation. You must have a legal basis for processing that personal data. You need to look at all the data you hold and make sure that you, you meet this requirement. The other thing to be aware of is a lot has been made of, of uh, email marketing and marketing by SMS um, or MMS. And so it's important to note that there's another set of rules that kick in here. So these are not the GDPR, these apply in addition. And this is the Privacy and Electronic Communications Regulations. So where you're sending um, direct marketing material electronically, so this is spam emails or texts or messages like that, another set of rules kick in, which generally need the opt-in consent from the recipient. And last but by no means least, um, you need to make sure that you can prove um, by way of your documentation that you are complying and how you comply with the GDPR in order to satisfy that new accountability principle. So that's my whistle stop through the um, data protection rules and how they work. I'm going to hand back to Freddie now, who's going to talk us through the next section of the webinar. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for that, James. Uh, we now move on to the question and answer part of the webinar. Um, but before I move on to my first question for James, I'm going to launch our first audience poll question. So if you'd like to answer that, Go to the uh, the go to webinar control panel, um, and uh, that that first poll question should be asked now. The question is, how prepared do you feel your business is for GDPR? So, if you want to uh, submit your answers to that, then uh, then go ahead. Um, but for now, I'll move on to to my first question for James, which is, James, what last minute steps should SME owners now be taking to ensure they have the right data protection measures in place ahead of GT GDPR? Uh, yep, thank you, Freddie. That's a very good question, and it's it's the fundamental one. Um, so it's the last thing that I mentioned on the last slide, really, which is that businesses need to understand what personal data they hold, um, 
why they hold it, and they need to establish a legal reason for doing so. So first and foremost, you must understand the data you hold, and you need to think laterally around this. So all organisations will hold personal data about their employees, and that's that's broadly uh, defined. So not just um, fixed-term employees, but also temporary workers, uh, volunteers, ex-employees, job applicants. You need to understand also what personal data do you hold about your customers. So that could be individuals if you market to consumers, or it could be points of contact at a business-to-business -business provider as well. So you might have the details uh, of a buyer at a large wholesale, wholesaler, and that would be that individual's um, work contact details, but nonetheless it's personal data. And the same with your suppliers. So again, um, you may have, they could be individual suppliers, such, such as freelancers, or you might deal with this, with the um, with a salesperson from a particular organisation. But again, you might hold, as an organisation, uh, the contact details of that salesperson, your buying history from them, and things like that. So you need to understand what personal data you hold. You need to understand or ensure that you have a legal basis for processing it. So it could be consent, but often it will be something else, like you need to hold that personal data in order to perform a contract with them. Um, or it might be in order to comply with a legal obligation. But it's important that you, you carry out that analysis, understand what personal data you hold, and understand the legal basis for doing so, and make sure that you've told people, to, to each other employees, and customers and suppliers, who you are and what you're doing with their personal data. Great, thank you, James. And um, and so just to go back to our to our poll question there and our answers from our first poll question: How prepared do you feel your business is for GDPR? Twenty-one percent of our audience today said not prepared at all. Sixty-three percent said a little prepared. Fifteen percent pretty well prepared, and only three percent have done everything that they need to do. So, still a long way to go for a lot of our audience today in terms of preparation for for GDPR. Um, I'm now going to launch our second poll question, which is, to what extent have you allocated a budget for spend on GDPR? So please go ahead and submit your answers to that. Um, and then James, my next question for you will be, how does a company owner go about gaining consent retrospectively from existing customers using their personal data? That's a very good question and probably one of the most commonly received questions we, we find as, as advisors in this area. Um, so. Um, just to give some background around this, um, if you're an organisation that sells products or services, very often you will want to be able to send marketing materials um, to, to those customers. Um, and that might be by email or it might be by uh, MMS or SMS um, saying about products or services, new offers, things like that. Um, and very often you need consent to do that, as I mentioned earlier. Uh, you need to not just comply with the GDPR, but there's also the PEC regulations as well, which sit on uh, alongside the GDPR. And these are actually quite complicated. And generally, under PEC, you need um, your customers' opt-in consent to receive marketing emails from them. Uh, but there are a couple of exceptions that you can rely on there, potentially. Um, and this are, these are where you're dealing with corporates or potentially people who bought products or services you, from you before. But it's crucial to get this area right. So um, I think the big takeaway is what you can't do is you cannot send people emails if they said that they don't want to hear from you. And this is the sort of thing that um, uh, we've seen a lot of action by the Information Commissioner uh, where organisations like Flybe or Honda have been sending out marketing emails to, to customers or prospective customers who hadn't opted in, who hadn't consented to receive that information and in fact has opted out and said they didn't want to hear from them. Um, the ICO can and will issue fines even under the existing law. And so it's very important to look at the personal data you hold, identify what permissions you have in place. Bear in mind that if somebody said that they don't want to hear from you, you cannot send them um, marketing, uh, you cannot send them an email to say, do you want to receive marketing material from us? Because that in itself is marketing material. And the ICO is as I mentioned earlier, taken action already when that's been the case. So this is quite a complicated area, and what we're seeing is that a lot of clients might have a big database of, say, in one case we had a client with a, a database of 1.5 million contacts, but they weren't able to um, identify consent from 
anywhere near all of those contacts. And in fact, the only uh, of that 1.5 million database, only 300,000 of the contacts had given their consent that the client was able to prove. So the rest had to be deleted. So I'm afraid uh, that is the reality of this. It's a really important thing to be aware of. Electronic marketing, if you get it wrong, is the sort of thing that can get you into trouble. Thank you, James. Um, just, to, just to remind our audience today, if you want to submit a question to be answered by James at the end of today's discussion, then, uh, then you can do via the control panel. Um, so I'll now move on to uh, the, uh, the results of our second poll question today, which was, to what extent have you allocated a budget for spend on GDPR? Uh, a massive 75% of today's audience have no budget uh, for spend on GDPR at the moment. 21% have have allocated a small budget, 6% uh, a medium budget, and just 1% a large budget. So, so people still still not allocating a budget for spend on GDPR at this stage. I'm go now going to launch our third poll question today, which is, bear with me. Have you hired any additional staff to meet demands of GDPR? So please get your answers in for that one. Um, James, uh, now to move on to another question for you. Do SME owners need to appoint a data protection officer to comply with GDPR rules? Well, that's a very good question, and it's an important one to be aware of, that there's a lot of misinformation out there. Um, so if you are under the impression that you only need a DPO if you've got more than 250 staff, or if you process personal data about over 5,000 data subjects, um, those requirements were set out in a previous draft of the GDPR that did not make it into the final version. So ignore anyone who's telling you if you've got more than 250 staff or if you've got personal data about more than 5,000 people, um, you, you need to appoint a DPO because that is not correct. Um, the criteria are set out in Article 37.1 of the GDPR, which says that three sorts of organisation must appoint a DPO. These are public authorities, so not many SMEs are going to be a public authority, so we can probably discount that. But the second category are those organisations who, whose core activities in, involve the um, large-scale monitoring of data subjects. So that could be uh, if you operate online and you monitor data subject activities when they move around your website, if you're conducting profiling and so on. So it could be quite a small company, but if they're doing something complicated online, and they're profiling individuals by collecting data about them and, and compiling um, a single customer view, for, for example, about an individual, then that means that um, that triggers the requirements under Article 37 of the GDPR and they will need to appoint a DPO. The third category is organisations whose core activities involve um, processing the special categories of personal data on a large scale. So if you remember the special categories of personal data, are things like individuals' physical or mental health, or their religious or philosophical beliefs, or their ethnic origin, or whether or not they're a member of a trade union or the sexual preferences. So you can see that if, for example, you operate, operate in the healthcare sector and you're collecting and, and storing information about individuals' health, or you're operating, say, a fitness monitor or something like that, anything around that, that triggers the um, special categories processing activity and you need to appoint a DPO. And the DPO needs to be an expert in data protection law and practice. Um, they need to be able to operate independently. So you can't appoint the owner of a business, for example, because they'll have a, they'll have a conflict of interests. You can't, afford, you can't appoint the head of HR or the head of IT, because again, they will have a conflict of interest if they're acting as the DPO and another role. But you can potentially outsource the role, and if you look at the final slide um, of this deck, uh, Wedlake Bell's outsourced DPO offering is called ProDPO, where we provide outsourced data protection officer services. In fact, in Germany, uh, where it's already mandatory to have a data protection officer, this is the way they do it. They outsource the role to a third-party data protection officer services provider. Thank you, James. And um, so the results are in for our, our next poll question. Um, and amazingly, 98% of our audience today have not hired an additional staff member to meet the demands of GDPR. Um, so now we move on to, to our next question, 
Kuchubei. Has your has your business developed a procedure for when GDPR is breached? So please make sure you submit your answers for that one. Um, and so James, my final question for you then today is, how should SME owners react once they suspect they've breached GDPR rules? And should they, should they attempt to fix the problem themselves or report the breach immediately? Thanks very much, Freddie. And that's a, that's a very good question. And it's, um, there is a difference here between breaching the GDPR rules and suffering a data breach. I'll just explain that if I may. If as a business you're aware that you are not compliant with the GDPR, uh, the good news is the GDPR does not take effect until the 25th of May. So the first thing you should do is try to put that right before the provisions take effect uh, in, in just over three months time. Um, perhaps more pressing is um, what happens if you suffer a data breach. So a data breach could be where um, you, your system is compromised so a hacker gets in, or you might have a rogue employee who takes personal data from your organization, or you might lose a laptop or a mobile device, or even a paper file individuals. Uh, so that's what we call a personal data breach. What the GDPR says is that you need to notify the data protection authority uh, within 72 hours. There are some exceptions to that, but generally the rule is if you lose personal data or you become aware that somebody's accessed personal data without authorization, you must tell uh, in the UK it's the Information Commissioner's Office um, and in serious cases you need to notify the data subject as well. For example, if you operate an e-commerce website and you lose personal data about individuals' credit cards, they are then exposed. So you need to let the data subjects know so that they can look out for suspicious transactions or even cancel their bank cards in, in serious cases. So breach notification is a significant development of the GDPR. And it's essential that organizations have in place a process so they can deal with this. And as I said before, uh, the GDPR accountability principle requires that you, you can you have a written process and if the ICO says what would you do if you suffered a data breach you can say we follow this breach notification process this is how we manage it so it's absolutely crucial thank you james and uh so i'm just going to share the results of our final poll question today uh, has your business developed a procedure for when gdpr is breached and 92 percent of our audience have not yet developed a procedure for, for when gdpr is breached so something for for a lot of smes to think about still in the run-up to to the deadline um we're now going to um to move on to to the audience question uh, part of the part of the webinar um thank you for all your questions that you've submitted so far they've, they've come flooding in and uh, we've received lots of them. Unfortunately, we can't ask them all to James today, but please please do get in contact with Wedlake Bell if you need any help with your GDPR services. So, so James, the first question I'll ask from our audience today is, um, is one about uh, repeat customers uh, for someone's database. So we've got a question here and it reads, we have a lot of repeat customers in our database. How is retention of their data affected by the principle of storage limitation? And can we store information such as perennial late payer and other information? Um, so that's a, that's a good question. It's quite a specific question. Um, generally speaking, what the information commissioner uh, would expect to see is that you have um, a reasonable process behind how long you store personal data. So as I said, and the storage limitation period, you can't hold personal data uh, indefinitely. And so what you need to have in place is a record retention schedule that says how long you hold personal data for, and after which that personal data is deleted. So it might be uh, reasonable to hold repeat customers' personal data for a, for a period of time, and perhaps a delay period after that. Um, and then after that period is elapsed, you, you would have to delete it. So the general the general presumption is that you can't hold personal data uh, indefinitely. Regarding comments such as uh, late payer or, or other comments, another thing that comes up quite frequently is where um, an organisation interviews a potential re recruit. The thing to be aware of is that if you hold, if you make comments about individuals, as I said at the outset, um, personal data includes statements of opinion about um, individuals, and of course we have a right under the subject access right to see that information. So if one of your customers says to you, I want to see a copy of all the personal data you hold about me, 
it would have to include that comment, uh, persistent late payer. Or, for example, if you if you interview somebody uh, for a position with your organisation and you make comments on their CV or uh, notes for your in your system as to what sort of candidate they were and they were derogatory, bear in mind that that individual has a has a legal right to see what you said about them. So while you can make those comments for for um, reasonable reasons, of course. Um, you need to be aware of the fact that the, the, the data subject can see those see those comments you've made and they have a legal right to doing so. So be very careful um, around that area. Great, thank you, James. Um, we've got another, another question here from an audience member who has an accountancy business. And their question is, will I be required to use a portal to send tax returns, accounts, payroll, et cetera, to my clients? And so that's a, re a reference to the um, security principle. So what the GDPR requires is that you, you implement appropriate measures to protect personal data um, from, from unauthorized loss, damage, and so on. So uh, a portal may be a, may be a way of doing it. Um, what the GDPR would expect you to do is, is look at what you're doing with personal data um, and identify the risks and probably carry out a data protection impact assessment. So you would... Um, Identify the risk in, in sharing personal data, uh, for example, with HMRC or about your, about your customers. You've got to make sure that, that the, the risk is clearly that the personal data could go, the tax return could go to the wrong recipient or it could be uh, intercepted in transit. So uh, a, a portal might be a way of achieving that. But what the ICO would expect to see is that you've identified what the problem is, which you've already mentioned. You've carried out a data protection impact assessment and you've documented that. You've thought about what the risks are, and you've taken reasonable steps to address those risks. Okay, great. Thank you, James. And then, um, so moving on to, uh, to our next audience question. Can you advise if I need to add a statement about use of data on my website contact form? I don't sell online. This is just so that people can get in touch with me. So one of the rights under the GDPR is the right to transparent information. In other words, when we do things with personal data, we need to tell um, the data subject who are affected what it is we do with that personal data, uh, such as where we store it, who we share it with, how we keep it secure, what their rights are, um, and how long we keep it for. So those, are, those requirements are set out in Articles 13 and 14 of the, um, the GDPR. So if you're collecting personal data online, albeit for inquiries by the sounds of it in this particular query, you would need to have a, a, a means of providing that information to the data subject. So you probably need a website privacy notice, um, or the, what's, what's often um, erroneously referred to as a privacy policy, uh, and that will tell people uh, who, who submit their personal data what, exactly what you're going to do with it. And the point is that um, you shouldn't do things with people's personal data that they wouldn't expect. So if somebody makes an inquiry about your, your website, whatever that may provide, and you need to explain um, what it is you're going to do with their personal data. And you shouldn't then use it for another purpose, for example, uh, selling it to a third party data broker so that they can send them marketing materials. Great, okay, thank you, James. Um, got another another question here from a, from a bookkeeping company, uh, and they ask, what is the statutory of limitations for holding information on their system? Uh, they work with a, a lot of clients and they need to hold a lot of data for a prolonged period in case of disputes. Um, this business owner has been told the limit is 10 years, but they can't confirm this at the moment. Can you help them? Um, well, I think that's this, this points to the, the first of the questions about how long you can hold personal data for. What you need to have in place is a data retention policy. Now, um, obviously giving specific legal advice is, is beyond the scope of this webinar, um, but I can tell you what you need to know um, is, is that you need to have a data retention policy that tells you how long you hold personal data for, and that will depend on the categories of the personal data. So you might hold your employees, uh, personal data about your employees, your ex-employees for one period of time, and for your customers to whom you provide bookkeeping services for another period of time. You need to set that out in a record retention policy. And there will be considerations like, you know, how, how long um, will it be that we may need to uh, defend ourselves in legal proceedings? And those, those will be the drivers for how long you hold that person data, as well as regulatory considerations like what you need to do to meet HMRC requirements. And if you're in a regulated sector, for example, if you're subject to financial conduct authority rules, 
So uh, I'm afraid a, a specific answer um, is legal advice, um, which we'd be very happy to discuss offline. But in broad strokes, what you need to have is a data retention policy or data retention schedule um, that says how long you hold each category of personal data for. Great, thank you, James. Um, got a, we're going to move on to a more general question now about networking at events. One of our audience members asks, if someone has given you a business card at an event, does this automatically mean they consent for you to contact them directly? Uh, that is a good question. It's something that we're, we're advising on a lot. So the answer is, it really depends on what the expectations are what, what of that individual. Now, strictly speaking, the GDPR would say um, you need their opt-in, uh, we, we need their consent um, to, to send them. It depends what you're going to do with that business card. But if you're going to then try to sell products and services to that person, um, you would need their consent to do so. Now, the, the GDPR definition of consent is quite strict, and what it requires is a positive affirmation by the data subject. So the data subject needs to do something. Uh, it needs to be unambiguous. Uh, it needs to be uh, explicit, specific, and so on. So um, if somebody gives you a business card and a, and a trade show, strictly speaking, there are quite a few hoops that you need to jump to jump through before you can start sending them marketing materials. Um, so broadly speaking, it depends what your business does. It may be that you've obtained the, the business card, in fact, because you want the products and services from that person. But I'm guessing in the circumstances, that's not what this question is asking. It's whether or not you can um, obtain, uh, or it's, it's whether or not you can send your marketing materials to the person who's giving you a business card. There's various, there's quite a lot of variables about this, depending on whether it's an individual or it's a person in their business capacity. So they've given that uh, business card to you, obviously in a work context, uh, that's a slightly different position. Um, and bear in mind that both the GDPR and the PEC regulations will apply to what you do with that card. So. So I'm afraid, um, again, it's not a, it's not a clear-cut answer, and I, I can't give you the legal advice over this webinar. But essentially, um, you need to have a, a, a policy in place over when you receive business cards, how you deal with that. Because strictly speaking, you need uh, consent to meet the requirements of the GDPR and um, and the PEC regulations if you're then going to send electronic marketing materials. Great. Thank you, James. Um, with just a few more questions to go with before we before we sort of look to wrap things up. Um, this next one next one is about email marketing. If someone has opted out of email marketing or their emails hard bounce, should you delete them from your system? Um, the answer is, unless you have a legal reason for holding uh, their personal data uh, on an ongoing basis, then then yes, certainly sending unwanted marketing material to people. Um, it's, it's a surefire route to get on the ICO's radar. And if you look at the ICO website and see enforcement action that the ICO has taken, you'll see that a lot of that is where where um, businesses have sent marketing materials that people didn't want. So if somebody is opting out from receiving further marketing materials from you, certainly don't send the marketing materials. Now you may or may not uh, have a legal reason for holding on to their personal data. For example, if they've bought products or services from you, or if they've applied to a job with you, and so there may be another reason for holding on to that. But in the absence of another reason, the safest option is to delete that personal data. Um, there's a, one potential exemption there, and that's where you, um, if you buy in lists, uh, database, uh, database lists for marketing purposes, you may want to hold that, uh, that email address to say, do not market to this contact. Otherwise, there's a risk that if somebody's opted out from your database and then you um, buy a marketing list and the name pops up again and you don't know that they've objected because you've deleted their record, then you may find yourself sending them email messages again to get yourself into trouble. Um, but that's, that's broadly the, the thing to be aware of there. Generally, if somebody said that they don't want to hear from you, you shouldn't hold their um, personal data for uh, you shouldn't continue to hold their personal data. The other thing is in relation to where you get bounce backs, um, that may well be an indication uh, that the personal data that you hold is is not up to date. And if you remember when I talked through the principles, um, one of the principles is that personal data must be held accurate and up to date. So um, if you've got a bounce back because it looks as though the email you have, uh, the email address you have, is incorrect, um, then obviously that potentially a breach of uh, the, the accuracy 
data protection principle. Great, thank you, James. Um, so one last question for today from our audience. Um, one from our from a business owner here whose uh, who's group headquarters is in Australia, and they ask, since our majority of data is held on secure servers at our headquarters in Australia, what additional steps do we need to take to properly comply with GDPR? Very good. Um, I'm glad that question's come up because, uh, it's, as I mentioned in, in the, at the beginning of the slides, the directive applies across Europe. So if you're in Europe, uh, in any of the member states as a business, you'll be subject to European data protection laws. Uh, the same with the GDPR. If you're in Europe, uh, you'll be subject to GDPR. However, if you go outside Europe, there, there isn't, that, isn't necessarily that protection. Um, so what you need to, to do is you need to um, make sure that the third country to which you're sending personal data provides appropriate uh, measures to, to protect personal data. Now, there are some approved countries, if they have data protection laws in place, then, you, then it's what's called an approved country, and it's transferring personal data to those countries as, is, is as though it was in the um, European Union. So, for example, Argentina, Canada, um, and various other countries. However, um, as far as I'm aware, Australia is not approved as, as a um, destination country. So if you transfer personal data from Europe to Australia, you need to make sure that that personal data is protected. And there's a number of means of doing this. And it might seem counterintuitive, even if it's processing, or even if it's sending personal data to your own headquarters, um, and those headquarters have to be outside of Europe, uh, there's no automatic exemption. There's various things you need to put in place to enable that transfer. And that often comes as a surprise to companies that assume that there's an exemption to the transfers rule in relation to their employees or whether they're transferring personal data to their own headquarters. There is not. So you must make sure that you have the measures in place to protect that personal data. Now, how you do that is a, is a specific question that we need to talk to you about the facts um, uh, and the nature of your company. Uh, but broadly speaking, if you're transferring personal data out of Europe, even if it's to a related company, um, you need to have measures in place to protect that transfer. Great. Thank you, James. Thanks for those answers. Um, I think that draws, that's going to conclude our, uh, our audience answer question and answer session today. But um, remember, you can get in touch with Wedlake Bell again uh, if, you, if you want your question answered. Uh, James, is there, is there a good way for, uh, for our audience members to get in touch with you? Um, yes, of course. So um, thank you for that. I've just moved to the next slide. So you can find me on LinkedIn. Um, my Twitter handle is j at jcastroedwards. Or if you um, simply type James Castro Edwards into the internet, it should um, fire you through to the Wedlake Bell page, which has my details. Um, there is also my email address there. So please um, do feel free to get in touch uh, if you need further advice. And as I mentioned, uh, at the bottom of that is ProDPO. So ProDPO is the um, outsourced data protection service that Wedlake Bell offers and, and which I lead. So that has a separate website. So, so there's a number of ways of getting in touch there. Uh, and of course, we accept um, Carrier Pigeon as well, if, if you like to communicate, communicate that way. Great. Thanks very much, James. Uh, and um, from real business's perspective, that concludes uh, today's webinar about GDPR. Um, but do stay tuned for, uh, for all that we've got. We'll, we'll be having some more webinars uh, throughout this year. So, uh, so make sure you keep up to date with us. Uh, but for now, thanks very much, James, and goodbye. Thank you.